brand new to uh, Biola, to Talbot, you've come in and you might think this is a typical chapel service. In some ways it is, but I'm actually going to have to begin by interpreting a theme, going into a theological truth, talking about some history. So it'll probably be unusual in that sense. And of course, this theme will be carried throughout the year, but my job is sort of unpack some of the theological basis of that theme. As you've heard, we've been in a series, Sola Scriptura, two years ago, Sola Fide last year, and today, Sola Gratia, and again, Sola just means alone or only, and, and uh, Gratia is just a Latin expression for grace. Grace alone is our theme. So I'm going to talk to you today about grace alone. The doctrine was not invented in the Reformation, though we talk about it as tied to the solas of the Reformation. It was actually re-emphasized, rediscovered, re, uh, refocused as well. So my aim is to explain the doctrine of grace alone in such a way that you have a better understanding and more importantly, you have a greater appreciation of God's work in Christ. So that provides really grace to those who are here today as followers of Jesus, right? The Bible has always um, taught that grace, like, um, and many more, are gifts from God. In 1 Corinthians 4, 7, it says this, what do you have that you did not receive? There's always a sense that God is the provider. He is the gift giver. But on the eve of the Reformation, 500 plus years ago, the church was pushing the selling of indulgences that as a way of reducing or eliminating uh, altogether one's time spent in a place called purgatory. Uh, People were desperate for a guarantee that God would forgive their sins, so they drove themselves deeper into poverty trying to buy God's gracious love. And then this is exactly what someone by the name of Martin Luther and others, but Martin Luther objected to. He said in a series of theses he nailed to a door in a church in Germany, he said that only God has the ability to forgive sins. That was in Thesis 5 and 6. And posting of these 95 theses known, this German monk then starts, or we might say rightly, inflames what was already moving towards a reformation towards a biblical orthodoxy and a re-engagement of the doctrine of uh, by grace alone. So Luther protested, and that's why we use the word. Not, it's not a direct line from him protesting to the term. There's some German princes between there. But Luther protested, and that's why we talk often about Protestants as well. That's where the language comes from, is the protestations from a group of princes later. But it was more than a protest. Again, it was a rediscovery of a biblical series of biblical doctrines. There are five pillars of the Reformation, all scriptural ideas. Let's look at a chart that sort of illustrates that. So we maybe have seen already sola scriptura, uh, again, by, by scripture alone, by faith alone, sola fide, by grace alone, sola gratia, and in the next year, sola Christus, and the year after that, sola de gloria. Now, some of you are doing the math, and you're not going to complete this series with us. There is, we do have uh, master's degree programs if you're an undergraduate student as well, and uh, I just wanted to share that with you as well. So that's kind of what it looks like if you instead, or if you're really all in on the solas of the Reformation, this is actually the template for a tattoo of the five solas if you'd like to do that. As the, uh, as the first Talbot Dean with tattoos, I thought I should mention that at some point. Uh, Clint, I'm making assumptions about your lack of tattoos. I could be wrong. But I think that's the case. So theologically, the phrase grace alone encompasses how we understand our sin and God's means of redeeming us. Salvation from the first to the last is God's work, and it's a work of God's grace, never a person's work. In that way, there's no room for anyone to boast. We Grace alone eliminates pride and focuses on God and His grace and glory alone. So, and, and this passage we're going to look at is really kind of a contrast of works versus grace. And what does that look like, and how do we understand this? A friend of mine recently, uh, recently died, and he was famous for many things, but one of the phrases that he said was that works is, I obey, I obey God, I do what God says, I try to follow the rules, I obey, therefore I am accepted. And then he said, but grace is, I am accepted, therefore I obey. That was Pastor Tim Keller as well. So if I follow all the rules, then God will bless me. Grace is I can't follow all the rules, and Jesus forgives me. Works is I strive to live a holy life, and I'm a good person. There's pride there because I'm afraid of God. Maybe there's fear there. Grace says because Jesus loves me, he has awakened my heart to him. If I do certain things, God will be less mad, works tells us, and I'll be a better person. But Jesus, on the other hand, grace says Jesus did the right things, and we can only be right with God by placing faith in 
him. So that's what I look at. The gospel of grace is so much better than the enslaving gospel of works. So we're going to look to the scripture and look at some of the emphases that are actually contained here. There's actually four things we'll go through quickly together. If you're a note taker, you can jot these down. If not, just follow along. Number one, we're going to, I'm going to look through the passage now, but number one, righteousness by works brings bondage. So in other words, trying hard to be righteous by your own deeds actually puts you in a sense, in a place of spiritual bondage. Righteousness by works brings bondage, but Jesus brings humble confidence. We'll see that in a minute. Having gained Christ, abiding in his righteousness. So Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, says this. Further, Paul writes, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. And it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision. Just seemed right for our first chapel of the year to talk about circumcision. So we'll do that as well. So something's going on here when Paul writes to the Christians at this place called Philippi. And something's going on where they're perhaps being influenced by people who maybe are saying that they, we are the circumcision. What does that mean? Well, we're not going to you know, get shirts that say that. But, but this is a lot about circumcision, right? And circumcision was a sign of a covenant with God. And circumcision here is also a shorthand for all the Jewish rules that they would seek to follow. So when he says we, these, all these rules, we are, we are of the circumcision, he's cautioning, and Paul is cautioning the Christians about Philippi, about going around and interacting with those trying to impose rules and religion and ritual over grace. Now, now here's the thing. Don't just think this is something 2,000 years ago. The reality is there are people inside church and the Christian life that are trying to impose their rules still today. There are people within the church who do that. Maybe there are people within your family who do that. And look how quickly, though, he goes from rejoice in the Lord to cautions about rules imposed by religious people. See, religious people often like to make themselves miserable and then to make everyone else miserable by the rules that they impose. And he says, watch out for the dogs, strong language that's there. But essential, anyone, he says, watch, whatever, whenever anyone says it's grace plus something or Jesus plus something, they're teaching something that's not just wrong, but it's anti-gospel and you have to watch out for that kind of false teaching. The entire world 500 years ago, the Christian world, was caught up in teachings like this. And the reality is, is that grace alone is not just a doctrine that they reemphasized in the Reformation. It's something that the Bible teaches and Christians have believed for 2,000 years. I used to be the interim pastor of a church in Chicago called the Moody Church, which is the strangest name of a church ever. Some days they're happy, some days they're sad. But... Um, <laughs> But the Moody Church, I was the interim there for four years. Nobody should be the interim of anything for four years. But I got in the habit of quoting former Moody Church pastors over the years. And I'll quote one from Warren Wearsby. He said, a woman was arguing with her pastor about this matter of faith and works. And he says, she said, I think that getting to heaven is a little like rowing a boat. She said, one oar is faith, the other is works. If you use both, you get there. If you only use one, you go around in circles. Wearsby said, there's only one thing wrong with your illustration. No one is getting to heaven in a rowboat. (laughs) Jewish rules in Philippi meant that people were communicating circumcision as a necessity of the faith. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details of what circumcision is, but they, they thought you needed circumcision for becoming a new Christian, for maybe adult male converts, right? Um, and, and, and it, Paul writes, no, 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 it's, it's, it's not grace plus saying certain players. It's not grace plus circumcision. It's not grace plus giving to a certain cause. It's Jesus. Grace plus nothing. Titus chapter 3 verse 5 says, he saved us. Would you say those three words out loud with me together? He saved us. One more time. He saved us, not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. Say it with me again. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So how can we say these rules are no longer needed? Well, these, these laws in the Old Testament were meant to point to someone, to help us to see who was coming, what was forthcoming. So Paul He's about to say, we are the circumcision. How? Because Jesus fulfilled the law. So we are the circumcision. Now, it doesn't mean that having become a follower of Jesus, you won't exert effort to grow in your faith. Dallas Willard put it this way, grace is not opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. 
So I want you to miss that. Grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. You can't earn what God has given by grace. And so 500 years ago, in this historic moment, Martin Luther saw the church of his day adding rules, like Paul wrote about 2,000 years ago where people were trying to add rules, and requiring people to go and confess to a person to get their sins forgiven, or to give money, to get out of purgatory, to crawl on their knees on a pilgrimage to be right with God. He protested, and that's ultimately why we talk about being Protestants. Luther did all that, actually. I was just recently in Rome and went to the church where he would crawl up those steps, and still there, the steps are still there. Luther did that. He climbed the stairs of a church in Rome on his knees, praying to the Father in every step, because each time he was told, each step, I walk those steps, each step would redeem a soul from purgatory. But then he got to the top and wondered if it was actually true. So I'm going to show you an historic reenactment of it, right? So, but I have to give you a little background before I do. I'll show you in some graphics that I hopefully will be helpful. But again, this is a history of 500 years ago, but it's also a history of about seven years ago. About seven years ago was the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And we started our series a few years after that. We didn't start it in the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. We were pacing ourselves. I don't really know. But here we are in this series. So sola gratia it is. So, um, so during that time, um, uh, I, I had the privilege of being there in Germany, in, in uh, Americans say Wittenberg, the others say Wittenberg, and so I was, had the privilege of being there. And uh, one of the things you'd find is, is that there was a huge run on some toys called Playmobiles. Now you probably, maybe you've heard of Playmobiles, but Playmobiles' greatest selling figure ever in history was this, right here. There it is. Isn't that crazy, right? So the greatest selling, for some reason, everybody wanted to get a Playmobil of Martin Luther. As a matter of fact, it was the fastest selling Playmobil of all time, according to the Guinness Book right here. This is actually the Guinness Book. And at one point, there were 472 of these sold per hour around the world. Martin Luther was cool in that one short time. Now, let me tell you the story, and if it's okay, I'm going to use Playmobiles to do it. So Luther grew up as a kid struggling with what it meant to be right with God. He's always kind of thinking through some of these things, struggling through. But one day, I'm jumping forward in the story, during a lightning storm, Luther was afraid for his life, right? This lightning struck down. He cried out to one of the saints that if God would save him, he'd become a monk. Here he is crying out to God right there. While being a monk and he became a monk, right? He, while reading the Bible, he found that it was God's mercy, not our works, that made us right with God. He kept studying and he kept learning the scriptures. The church at that time was teaching that there are things you must do to be right with God or that you could give and God would, for example, get you out of purgatory. Back to a famous line from someone named Johann Tetzel who explained, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. People were trying to buy God's grace, going into poverty or despair when they could not. So Luther eventually nailed a group of theses to the door, which was like the town bulletin board. Here he is right there doing that. So 500 years ago, he nailed 95 theses to the door. Theses 5 and 6 point out that only God can forgive sin. He started teaching the Bible, and people just kept coming, and the message kept spreading over and over again as he continued to teach the Bible. He eventually translated the Bible into German, and then common people began to read the Bible and understand its message of grace as he continued this gospel work. He was persecuted, stood up for the truth, and more, and this is our history lesson for today. Now back to some theology. So I don't want you to miss this because it just reminds us alone is a key word. Grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone. We go through the solas because it's not Jesus and baptism. Nope, it's not Jesus and wearing a suit at church. Nope, it's not Jesus and voting the right way. Nope, it's not Jesus plus speaking in tongues or not speaking in tongues. Nope, it's not Jesus plus being a Calvinist or being a Lutheran. It's Jesus plus nothing. And Paul uses strong words, beware of the dogs because of the error that was there. They are evildoers, he says. Their circumcision mutilates the flesh but does not revive the heart. So number one on our outline, and some of you are doing the math and the time left, number one is the longest point because of the special history lesson with Playmobiles, no less. Number two, Jesus brings, instead, Jesus brings humble confidence. Jesus brings humble confidence. Remember, 
Righteousness by works brings bondage, but Jesus brings humble confidence, having gained Christ and abiding in his righteousness. Let's look at the next part of the passage. Philippians chapter 3, verse 3 through 6. For it is we who are the circumcision. Again, it's a recurring theme. T-shirts could be made. We who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If anyone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, Paul says, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day. These are all Jewish rules. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews in regard to the law of Pharisees. Someone who's super keeper of the law. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. So Paul wants them to know, if anybody has followed the rules necessary to say, to make a claim that righteousness comes by works, it would be Paul. But this contrast of circumcision is a beautiful picture, actually. Now our hearts have been circumcised. The Bible speaks at other places. We are the circumcision because our hearts have been circumcised. We are not the circumcision because we've kept the rules and are proud or because we kept the rules because we are afraid. Martin Luther himself said this, the law says do this and it is never done. Grace says, believe in this, and everything is already done. See, sisters and brothers, the gospel is not you do. The gospel is what Jesus did, and it changes everything. We have this been done by Jesus, what Jesus has done, and the joy of Jesus being gained is the joy of the gospel message. He, we, we've been supplied with God's grace. Now we have the confidence to approach God's throne with boldness because of God's grace. We are free from righteousness based on works and the ideas of our, of our self-worth, pride, or despair that comes with our identity be, being wrapped up in what we do and how hard we try. But you see, righteousness by works brings bondage, but Jesus brings joy and gives us this humble confidence. Righteousness by works leads us to have confidence in what we have done, but the gospel causes us to put confidence in what Jesus has done. It's a beautiful picture in Luke chapter 18, Jesus gives, Jesus tells the story, two men, this is Luke chapter 18, verses 10 through 13, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like these other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get, but a tax collector stood at a distance He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but he just beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I want you not to miss that because it changes the way we see things. I recognize for some of you, when I talk about self-righteous people, sometimes you think of other people who are self-righteous. Sometimes we're in a Christian college or Christian university or a Christian setting. You might say, well, you know, those people, they're a little, you know what, that is, that's actually an expression of self-righteousness against the self-righteous. It's very easy for us to to think that way rather than to embrace God's grace. And sometimes it takes a crisis to get there. When I was in college, when I was in my sophomore year of college, I was taking a biology class. And for some reason, um, it had to be a personal situation in my own life. I didn't necessarily go and explain to anyone some of the difficulty I was going through. I really started suffering in my grades. Matter of fact, I was, I was failing a class. And so I went into the biology professor. His name was, not kidding, his name was Dr. Fail. (laughs) F-A-L-E was his name. So I went into Dr. Fail. It seemed an ominous conversation. I was failing Dr. Fail's class. And this is a true story. It's not a preacher story. It's actually happened. Um, So I walked into Dr. Fail's class and I said, Dr. Fail, is there anything, I mean, how can I turn this around? What could I do? Extra credit, redo projects. What could I do to turn this class around? And he looked across the table, very nice man, and he said, he said, Ed, there's absolutely nothing you can do to pass this class. It's too far gone, and you're going to fail this class. And I got to tell you, that was the most freeing conversation I ever had. Because at that moment, there's nothing that I could do other than fail this class. Now, there wasn't grace on the other side of that failure. But imagine if we acknowledge there's nothing we can do in and of our own works to make God happy with us. But through Christ, he already has shown his love to us. We can acknowledge that we can't do it on our own, but God has done it in Christ for us. 
The joy of Jesus being gained is the joy of the gospel message. We've been supplied with God's grace, and now we have this beautiful confidence. There was a pastor named Chuck Swindoll, he used to pastor the Fullerton Evangelical Free Church. Some of you have connected with that along the years. And he was talking to someone named Howard Hendricks, and they were talking about legalism, people who try to put more rules rather than to revel in the beauty of grace. And here's what he said about legalism, an interview with Howard Hendricks, this is Chuck Swindoll, he said, the problem with legalists is that not enough people have confronted them and told them to get lost. Those are strong words, he says, but I don't mess with legalism anymore, I'm 72 years old, he's older now. What have I got to lose? Seriously, I used to count at a legalist, but they're dangerous, they're grace killers, they'll drive off every new Christian you bring to church, they're enemies of the faith, other than that, I don't have a strong opinion. So if I'm trying to force my personal list of no-nos on you and make you feel guilty if you don't join me, I'm out of line, I need to be told that. See, the reality is if we run after instead of the rules, it becomes exhausting. There's a scene at the end of the movie, The Help. I don't know if you've seen the movie, but Abilene, who loses her job after her boss is pressured into firing her, asks a crying, Hilly is her name, she said, ain't you tired, Miss Hilly? Ain't you tired? See, Hilly spent all her time trying to keep people happy, trying to follow all the rules. At the end of the day, they just made her more and more miserable. And I want to say to you that if you're someone who's trying to follow all the rules and finding yourself miserable and making everyone else miserable because of your views and your rules about religion, ain't you tired? Why don't instead you rest in the beauty of the grace of the gospel? Luther quit being afraid. He quit being tired. He rested in grace. And so can you. And you can be confident in Jesus. He's done it. He said, it is finished. It's not your work. Number three, having gained Christ. Remember the theme, right? Righteousness by works brings bondage, but Jesus brings humble confidence. Having gained Christ, abiding in his righteousness. Verse 7 and 8 says this, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ, right? When you understand the beauty of the gospel, everything else is like a loss. It's like, it's like done. It's gone. It doesn't matter so much. What is more, he says, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. So we, sister brothers, we have Jesus, the ultimate gift, the ultimate The ultimate joy is to be united with Him and eventually to be united with Him in eternity. When you get with what grace is, when you understand, and this entire year's theme is sola gratia, we're going to dwell deeply in the beauty of God's grace in these Talbot chapels. When you get what grace is, you will look back and actually grieve the years you lived as a Christian still under the bondage of works righteousness that distracted you from the amazing nature of the gospel of grace. And that's a beautiful moment when people see what ultimately that is. When you get grace, it changes everything. Again, Warren Wiersbe says this, like most religious people today, Paul had enough morality to keep him out of trouble, but not enough righteousness to get him into heaven. It was not bad things that kept Paul away from Jesus. It was good things. He had to lose his religion to find salvation. So I want you to think on with us the totality across this year of sola gratia. Now I want you to know that this message, this 25-minute message is not everything with every nuance and every detail about grace. It doesn't cover every topic or go down every path that you would in a longer conversation. This year of sola gratia won't just be about grace, but the theme will be recurring because we want you to walk in the beauty of God's grace and knowing that, how it changes everything. When you get to see how good grace is, you'll look back and say, why was I so passionate about working my way to God, trying to make God happy when he already loves me and sees me through Christ? 1 Peter 3.18 says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Sisters and brothers, Jesus is better. His grace is enough. You don't have to earn it on your own. This isn't even a salvation message, but if you're here and you don't know Christ, that's the good news of the gospel. But Christians need to be reminded. That's what Paul was doing here, reminding the Christians at Philippi that it is by grace alone and through faith alone. Number four, and finally, and I'll close with this. You know what it means when a new dean at his first chapel says, I'll close with this? Absolutely nothing, actually. Um, No, I'm kidding. We'll be done right on time. Number four, abiding in his righteousness. There's a place to abide, to walk in the beauty of that grace. Remember, righteousness by works brings bondage, but Jesus brings humble confidence, having gained Christ, 
abiding in his righteousness. Here's what it says. And to be found in him. What a beautiful few words. And to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead, righteousness, right standing before God, being in the right. A graceless religion makes you self-righteous, which pushes you against God and his good grace. A graceless religion makes you self-righteous and prideful and haughty. It's the difference between work for God and being found in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 and 4 says it this way, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who's blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. The gospel shapes us because the gospel properly understood makes us. So grace, you think of it as astoundingly easy and astronomically hard. It's easy because of its simplicity. It's hard because it requires complete surrender and trust to Christ. Jesus becomes this righteousness. He gives us, leads us, changes us, and in his sight, we have right standing. We find our confidence and our security. Listen, I'm glad you're here as you're beginning this new year. I want you to lean into all that the Lord has for you this year. But I want you to lean into all of those truths, resting in the beauty of the grace of God. Because righteousness by works brings bondage. You can come to a Christian university. You can come to a a school of theology. You can lean in and become self-righteous and haughty. And the end result is you're simply pursuing a workspace righteousness when Jesus calls us to grace. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon put it this way, he that thinks lightly of sin thinks lightly of the Savior. It's not an, not an ignoring of the import of dealing with sin in our lives, but it's doing so from a position and a place of God's grace. Listen, Luther is not the founder of our faith. We're not Protestants first, nor did the gospel start 500 years ago, but his church is founded on Jesus the rock and the gospel, which was rescued and reemphasized during the Reformation so we could walk as people saved by grace alone and through faith alone. So as we walk through this year together, let's lean on the beauty of God's goodness and sola gratia by grace alone. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.